today we're going to be discussing Guastavino's tile arches and vaults at the City Hall Station in Manhattan, New York City. And this is the City College team. My name is Abram Morris. I'm a second year. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm a third year. Hi, my name is Shao and I am a fourth year. And I'm Tamar and I'm also in my fourth year. As some background information on the station. City Hall Station was New York City's very first subway station and it was a great source of pride for the city. To showcase their pride and the city's innovation, they brought in professionals from many trades to construct the iconic architecture. The architects were George Lewis Hines and Christopher Grant Lafarge. The contractor was Rafael Guastavino and the sculptor was Guts and Borglum. Construction began in March of 1900 and ended in October of 1904. So the company that commissioned the station was the IRT or the Interborough Rapid Transit Company, MTA's predecessor. And during the period of time that it was being constructed, fires were quite common. Luckily, one of the facets of Guastavino's construction is that it's fireproof. Um, the unfortunate thing is that the station was decommissioned in 1945, so it's no longer accessible to the public, especially because of COVID. The only way to see it is to take the six train as it backtracks and switches direction. And so the origins of tile vaulting, which is what City Hall Station, how City Hall Station is built, is from the Mediterranean region dating back to the late 1300s is the earliest evidence we have, although it might have originated before. And it spread pretty quickly around Europe, Africa, and South America, but it didn't come to the United States until 1881, when Rafael Guastavino, the man, the myth, the legend, um, immigrated, and he immigrated to New York in 1881 with hopes of becoming a famous architect, a master builder. He had already gotten some fame for his tile vaults in Spain, and he wanted to progress his profession here. And he, and he founded the Guastavino Fireproof Construction Company here in the US, um, which was his contracting company. And he also improved tile vaulting methods. So tile vaulting is a technological feat because it uses extremely minimal material and therefore creates a very thin shell structure, but out of brick modules, not out of concrete or poor material. And therefore it doesn't even need much formwork, just guides and it becomes cheaper materially efficient. It's super strong because of its laminated nature. It's water resistant and it's fireproof. To even further understand tile vaulting, there are three main points to keep in mind. The first being the hanging chain identified by Robert Hooks is in perfect tension, but when flipped is in, is in perfect compression. This being called a thrust line is within the arch for it to be a stable structure. The second thing to keep in mind is that the relationship between the thrust line of the arc and its form are proportional. Carl Coleman, being a pioneer of the graphic static system, uh, will show the force and form diagram that creates this stable arch. The third point to keep in mind is that when the arch is in multiple layers at alternating angles, this will help disperse the load, making the arch even stronger. To start our investigation, we use GeoGebra to first plot the points of constraints given by the guide, APT guidelines. From that, we set up equations so that points A to D show the force at the four points, while E to I show the force. Although the form of, the, of our arch is a three to five ratio, Guasanovino recommends a one to 10 ratio for the perfect amount of strength and material usage. Although our strength is the same, we do use more material because of the constraints given by the competition. After finding the perfect or catenary curve for our arch given by the constraints, we, rhino, we model the model in Rhino to showcase how many tiles we would need for the construction, as well as any potential problems or issues that can arise during the construction phase. As we moved into the actual construction and fabrication of our arch, uh, the first step was to manufacture our form. 
which actually serves as a scaffolding for the creation of our arch. And this was created using the aforementioned uh, methods on GeoGebra. And we used this form and cut out a piece of plywood and verified that we had the correct catenary curve by hanging a chain and comparing it with the form of this plywood. For our venue of creation, we went to the International Masonry Institute in Queens, New York, which was an absolutely amazing place to construct our arch. Uh, we moved our materials into the space, put on our personal protective equipment, and began making our mortar and cutting our bricks to the correct size. To actually fabricate the arch, we used the method aforementioned by Xiao, where we put a first original layer of tile and then add mortar, tile again, mortar, and then tile for the top. Um, the first layer of tile is created using the form and plaster, which dries extremely quickly, allowing us to create this arch form without substantial uh, scaffolding. So in, in our case, we were able to create our arch only using our wooden form, which barely served a structural purpose. It merely served uh, a formal one so that we were able to maintain a, a very important catenary curve for the construction of our arch. The first issue that arose when loading our arch was a surface. We needed an even surface to distribute the load. Therefore, we put a wooden plank on the top of the apex of our arch. To start off, we used sandbags that were of 50 pounds and stacked them manually, two bags at a time on both sides at the same time so that there was an even distribution. Um, from that, we had a total of 27 sandbags, which equate to a total of 1,350 pounds. Um, because of the height, the sandbags were going in, we could not manually load it further, so we had to use a forklift. The forklift created a dynamic load, which was uneven and caused the failure of our arch. As predicted, I mean, there are five points where the thrust line touches the arch. And in this case, when there is pressure at the thrust line at the end, at the end of the arch, uh, this creates tension when uh, from the forklift, which causes the failure and broke our arch into four pieces. To preserve the City Hall Station in a long-term way, we want to take proactive measures, but we also want to treat that which we might not necessarily be able to see. Um, so we know that the skylights at City Hall Subway Station are mostly shattered and um, this can lead to easy water penetration, even though the skylights themselves are ornamental. And water penetration can cause um, severe damage to the arch because the water will be absorbed into the pores of the materials, the brick and the mortar. It can erode the mortar by dissolving various solutes within the water. And it can also undergo freeze-thaw cycles where the water freezes and expands, causing the masonry to crack um, and then melts again and like continues to migrate and cause the same thing in other parts of the arch. Um, and the salts do something called salt mobilization, which is when the salts are absorbed into the masonry and propagate and then explode and cause mechanical problems as well. And also, cracking and structural integrity of the masonry is compromised. We can test for cracks by this non-damaging technique called impact echo, um, which is lightly tapping the structure with less than 10 PSI um, to locate where cracks are present. And we can test for salts by, looking, by testing electric current. Um, and then we can treat uh, many of the problems with grout injection, which uh, enables us to uh, insert grout without removing any of the structural mem members of the arch itself. On behalf of the City College team, special thanks go out to Walter Sedovic, who was our APT mentor, Alan Feltoon and Jonathan Halsgrove, who both helped us at the International Masonry Institute. And uh, of course, our professor and faculty advisor, uh, Mohamed Bolasani.